Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for thank you so much for joining this session on connecting microcontrollers to the cloud. Um, I'm Tanmay Sen. I'm a product manager in in AWS Amazon Web Services, and I focus on um, edge devices, device software for the edge. Uh, talking about microcontrollers, microprocessors, um, and all. So within the AWS IoT org, um, there's this, there's this, there are two products, uh, embedded CSDK and free RTOS. And I work on, uh, on the road mapping and, um, and features for, for both of them. But anyways, um, my talk is about connecting microcontrollers to the cloud. And I'm going to discuss the various aspects of, of connecting these, these really constrained devices to, to, to the cloud. Uh, how do we do it? Um, and what are the various aspects of, of connecting these, uh, these using protocols such as MQTT or HTTP, the application layer protocols, or Bluetooth low energy, um, which is again a very popular, uh, popular transport protocol for, for um, low power devices. Before I dive into the connectivity protocols, um, I'll briefly talk about um, talk about the key attributes of connecting these microcontrollers to the cloud. What are, the, what are microcontrollers? And then I'm gonna talk about how, um, even when we, when we connect um, these devices to the cloud, how do microcontrollers and the IoT applications in general benefit from the cloud? Then I'm going to talk about the connecting uh, connectivity aspects of these um, uh, of, of, the, um, of microcontrollers using HTTP, MQTT, and PLE. And then um, towards the end, there's an important feature for IoT devices, all IoT devices, they need update, updatability of the firmware. So I'm going to talk about over the air updates and how it's done um, within, within AWS IoT and the feature that we have developed. So um, let's, let's dive in. What are microcontrollers? Microcontrollers are integrated circuits with a small processor performing, um, performing very simple tasks and very specific tasks like reading sensor data, crunching numbers, and sending it ahead for future processing. These are very constrained devices. We are talking about uh, megahertz in compute speed, early megahertz um, of compute speed, clock frequency, and kilobytes of RAM, just to give, an, uh, give you an idea of scale, uh, because most of the times we are, we are acquainted with application processors running gigahertz of clock frequency and megabytes um, and much more and higher of, of RAM and flash. So these are very constrained devices. And because of the specificity and the simplicity of these microcontrollers, they're really pertinent for IoT applications um, and designs looking for very low power applications. But these microcontrollers are part of, of the things in the Internet of Things. When we call IoT or Internet of Things, these microcontrollers become a huge part of that. And these, these can, can be found in everyday devices everywhere, in all industry verticals. You think about fitness trackers, you think about industrial applications, uh, vehicle automation, um, uh, think about medical, uh, medical equipment, asset tracking. You just name a few, you, wherever you find a sensor on an actuator, you'll see microcontrollers attached to it and sending data and num uh, crunching numbers. They're sold in billions of units every year because of the simplicity and the specificity. We use several microcontrollers to perform one, one single application. So you can find several um, uh, microcontrollers in, um, in one application and therefore they are sold in billions of units every year. But microcontrollers are very constrained devices and, and that's why they greatly benefit from connecting to the resource rich cloud. Now, when, when you talk about connecting these microcontrollers to the cloud, you see um, where they lie. At the bottom of the screen that you see, uh, bottom and left, you'll see microcontroller devices um, um, in, in, in several applications like, um, uh, like fans, uh, like uh, windmills or uh, uh, water faucets. Uh, automotive applications, they either connect directly to the cloud, maybe using uh, protocols such as Wi-Fi or uh, cellular, or through a more powerful gateway device. You could think of an application processor collecting, uh, acting as a hub and collecting data, aggregating data from all the microcontrollers that are connected to it. But as more and more devices um, connect to the cloud and send data to the cloud, the cloud enables us to do several things. They securely manage, they securely connect these, um, manage these devices at scale so that they connect to a broker 
and millions of microcontrollers sending millions and millions of kilobytes of data can, uh, can effectively um, uh, be managed at scale. You also onboard these uh, devices, manage these devices, and do firmware updates on the fleet of devices that are deployed in the field. So um, the cloud becomes an important aspect at that too. When you have several hundreds of thousands of millions of devices de deployed in the field, you need to audit these devices and detect anomalies. Uh, if you see any security vulnerability for any of the, de of the devices or the devices are sending um, packets that, that you think are anomalous, then you have then you then you can detect these and perform um, perform right actions needed for those. And further down the, further down the, um, the the cloud path, you see that you can perform data analytics, and 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 finally the most important thing is that you can fully integrate with other other AWS services or other cloud services like uh, like uh, a simple storage service Amazon S3 or EC2. Those are AWS services that you can use um, while when you connect to the IoT broker. However, connecting microcontrollers to the cloud takes careful design considerations, both on the device side and the cloud side. Um, let me let me try to understand, um, make you understand this by taking a, a very simple example, the example of a of a light bulb. Um, the block diagram on the right that you see is, is a representation of a program space of a microcontroller. The, um, the functionality, the green box that you see in the um, you see below, is basically um, just the, the functionality, the business value that, that um, any device performs. You could think of dimming the light bulb, turning it on and off at certain instants. You could change the color of the light bulbs. So, so, so this is the business value of any simple light bulb. But that is a small piece of code. But, are, but when you are thinking of connecting this light bulb to, to the internet, uh, to the cloud, you are basically thinking of adding several things. Connect communication stack um, for, for connectivity, security libraries, management of these, um, of these devices deployed in the field, security, over the air updates. So we are talking about several libraries that is just attached to, to the business functionality, the small piece of code. And this is completely undifferentiated that you have to write and stitch together to securely connect your light bulb to the cloud. And that's where open source libraries such as FreeRTOS can help you reduce the pain point, help you reduce the effort in connecting these microcontrollers to controller devices to the cloud. It provides everything that you need for connectivity and security and updates. So um, um, we, we think about the FreeRTOS kernel. FreeRTOS kernel is a market-leading real-time operating system for microcontrollers. Can be used for disconnected smart devices, but can also be can use can be used as a foundation for internet connectivity. And there are other software libraries like um, Bluetooth Low Energy, the abstraction stack for local connectivity, uh, cloud connectivity. You can think of MQTT and HTTP as the application layer protocol to connect to um, connect to any cloud. Um, and security libraries. And for, for security, I'm talking about data at rest and data in transit. So you need security in both aspects because whenever your certificates and credentials are stored on the device, you need security for those. And when data is sent from the device back to the cloud, you need that to be encrypted and secured and authenticated when it reaches the MQTT broker, for example. And apart from the libraries, you, you have to have security for the entire device lifecycle. And that's where over-the-air updates or, um, or um, updatability of these devices become really important. And with FreeRTOS, um, we, have, we have a feature, an integ integrated service that helps you deploy security, um, security fixes, bug fixes, and firmware updates directly to the devices on the field um, and, and back to remotely. All FreeRTOS libraries are, are open source. And uh, they are under the permissive MIT license. So you have the flexibility to change these libraries to, to, to suit your end application, whatever application that you design. You don't need to report any, anywhere. You don't need to for, pay, pay it forward. Just use the libraries um, however you see, um, see fit and you can customize it to your end, end application. Now let's talk about um, MQTT as one of the connectivity protocols and uh, one of the libraries that FreeRTOS provides as open source for cloud connectivity. MQTT is based on the OSS standard, OSS open standard. 
And MQTT is a lightweight publish subscribe uh, application layer protocol that runs on top of TCP IP. Um, it has a very small code and, and bandwidth requirements. That is, devices can sleep most of the time in most of the use cases and wake up only to send data, um, send data to, um, to a topic which, is, which it is subscribed to, which makes MQTT very suitable for IoT applications um, because it gives you scale and it pertains to constrained microcontroller devices. It uses a concept of topic, topic as a matching mechanism between publishers and subscribers. So publishers are basically that publish um, uh, data to a topic and subscribers are basically um, um, clients that are listening to a topic and see what data has been published. Publishers and subscribers are, two, um, are the two ends and they can communicate in several ways. For example, is a point-to-point -point pattern. Um, a point-to-point -point pattern is when two things use a single MQTT topic as the communication channel. So they use a single topic, the pu publisher subscribes the pertinent data to the topic and the subscriber listens to it and takes action based on that. The second is a broadcast pattern. Broadcast pattern is when a single publisher sends out the same message to all the subscribers, all the clients that are subscribed to the topic. For example, um, a weather station transmitting a broadcast message to all the buses in the, in the nearby area. All the buses can listen to the packet, um, to, to the message, say um, it's, it's really windy or it's really cold and take actions based on that. The third is the fan in pattern. Fan in pattern is the exact reverse of the broadcast pattern where several publishers um, send data to a single topic and one subscriber is listening to it. And this is really useful for use cases such as um, uh, you, can, you can think of robotic arms sending health status regularly to the same topic and um, the IoT application, the subscriber listening to it, aggregates it and the aggregate data makes sense, makes application more, more pertinent and, uh, and, and reliable. So these, these are the three, um, uh, three communication patterns that's, that is mostly seen for IoT devices. Um, but let's um, dive into one of the uh, use cases on a point-to-point -point pattern or a point-to-point -point communication aspect. The diagram that you see on the right is, is uh, let's take an example of that. The repair service that you can see as the publisher is basically sending, um, sending status data, shipment data of uh, refills to the topic, um, uh, to, the, to the topic refill. And then there are two um, washing machines connected to it as, as uh, subscribers listening to it. And the washing machine on top sees that um, the status is it has been shipped. While the shipment data has been transmitted, it also gets the arrival day, arrival status data. So it alerts the user that the, the new refill is going to arrive by this and this date. The, the one, the, the Moshe machine in the, um, in the, um, that you see below is listening to another topic, which says um, the same publisher publishes that it, it has been delayed and it alerts the delay to the user. So this is how a point-to-point -point pattern is also used for one-to-many communication, where a single unique topic is used for and rotated through for several, um, several clients and several, several subscribers uh, subscribe to it. Um, for connecting microcontrollers to, um, to, to the cloud, you basically, for AWS IoT in general, you basically need transport layer um, uh, encryption, which is TLS 1.2. Uh, that is the recommended um, protocol for um, encryption of data. And for authentication, we use X5509 client certificates um, so that when the devices connect to the broker, they're authenticated and then uh, the communication can happen. FreeRTOS also provides a second library um, for cloud connectivity. It's the HTTP library, but it's, it's used for a very different use case. Um, several microcontroller devices that use HTTP to connect to the cloud. Um, and it, it makes us wonder as to why an IoT device would use a protocol typically used for, for web-based communication. So we talked to several customers and 
most of these customers use HTTP for high bandwidth downloads. Um, for example, if you want to download videos, uh, images to your IoT devices. One of the biggest applications for that has been kitchen appliances. Um, you think of a coffee maker that can, that is using HTTP to download uh, recipe images. Um, your your uh, refrigerator downloading images of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of of uh, let's say um, recipes. Even in orchards, uh, agricultural use cases, you think of uh, sensors sending and uploading images of pests to the cloud. These are the use cases that that need large files um, to be uploaded or downloaded. We are talking about MBs here. And those are the use cases where HTTP becomes more pertinent. The second thing, uh, second scenario that we have seen from customers is also, um, also to conform to existing HTTP-based legacy systems. A customer has already designed um, their entire infrastructure IoT platform based on HTTP, and they would not try to move away from HTTP because of the legacy purposes. And that's why HTTP becomes pertinent for those two. FreeRTOS distributes the HTTP library that uses the HTTPS 1.1 protocol, uh, protocol standard to download and upload files to Amazon S3, the simple storage service, or to any web-hosted uh, web service. And it secures the file transfer using TLS 1.2 again, um, so that any communication, any uploads, any downloads is done securely. Uh, and it's completely managed. At this point, I'll um, I'll pause. I'll I'll pause for a bit to see if if there are any questions. Hi, Tamoy. I don't see any questions at this time. I'll just take this moment to remind everyone: if you do have questions, you can pose them either in the chat box, the Q and A box, or raise your hand. Thank you. And Tim, I just wanted to add, I dropped the reference to your AWS white paper in the chat um, for anybody that was interested in learning more about that diagram that you had put in there. So if you have anything to add uh, topic wise, just uh, let me know and I'll put it in there. Yeah, absolutely. I, that, I think that's a, that's a really good white paper. I put a reference, um, uh, I guess, not a link, but just a statement to it too. It talks about uh, all the three protocols and best practices for connecting your devices to, to AWS IoT talks about point to point, talks about uh, fan in, talks about broadcast, and what are the best practices to do there. So thanks, thanks so much, Chris, and you'll really find that useful. Well. All right, if there are um, no questions at this point, um, I'll, I'll move ahead. That sounds great, Tanmoy, thank you. Yeah, thanks. All right, let's talk about Bluetooth Low Energy. Um, there are millions of devices such as fitness trackers, headsets, and simple sensor devices like humidity sensors, temperature sensors. Um, they, connect, um, uh, they connect locally to any mobile phone that we have seen, but they could also greatly benefit if they could connect to, um, um, connect to the cloud for, uh, I'm sorry, this is ping. No worries, Tim. Well, that happens to me all the time, too. I'm sure all of us with these Zoom calls have had that experience. <laughs> yeah, I, I re really apologize for that. Um, all right, it's gone now. All right, there are, there are millions of devices, as you have seen, sensor, uh, sending sensor data to the cloud, and they run on batteries. Um, they are really um, trying to get to as low as possible on power so that the batteries, the, the battery life is, um, uh, is elongated. But uh, these devices typically run Bluetooth low energy or BLE and would be greatly benefit from securely connecting to the cloud. By connecting to the cloud, they have access to all the different, uh, different um, services and features that cloud offers, for example, over the air updates, device shadow, that these constrained microcontrollers running the BLE Bluetooth low energy stack would not be able to do it alone. And therefore, um, because these devices do not support uh, IP, they need a gateway uh, such, as, such as a mobile phone that you can see on the diagram in the middle to connect to the cloud. The process, and if you try to take a simple Bluetooth device and connect it to the cloud, the process involves several steps and can be really um, time consuming. You first have to select the microcontroller that you would need to connect to the cloud and then select the compatible PLE stacks. Um, integrate all the cloud connectivity libraries to, um, to the 
corresponding mobile SDKs, the Android and iOS SDKs. Finally, code them, test them using the Android and iOS device, and the, then you are finally ready. This, this problem becomes worse when you're trying to evaluate um, different microcontrollers at the evaluation stage, and you have to uh, do the process over and over again to see if this, this makes sense and whatever, um, uh, whatever microcontroller that you choose. So Free Atos acknowledged this problem and talked to several customers. And um, the way we proceeded with this, we provided a standardized API there um, uh, to interface with the BLE stacks provided by microcontroller vendors. So with that abstraction layer, with the standardized API layer, you don't have to change your application whenever you change the, uh, the microcontroller underneath, but you just have to um, port it to the right API layer and you are done. This also enables the use of uh, standard generic access profile and generic attributes profile, GAP and GAT, to create BLE applications. For those who are not aware, um, according to BLE specifications, GAP defines how BLE devices broadcast availability. So there might be several BLE devices that are pinging their availability and status. And then um, whenever it connects to a mobile phone that, that is interested in communicating with the BLE device, um, the GAP protocol is pertinent towards that. GAT, on the other hand, describes how data is transferred when the connection is established. You, um, with a mobile phone and a BLE device, when you are connected, GAT is how you communicate, how you transfer data. So um, the, the FreeRTOS API layer that I just talked about, it, provides, it's also, it's all, it also provides companion Android and iOS SDKs to integrate with AWS IoT functionality. So um, you have your FreeRTOS SDK, the standardized API that connects to uh, the BLE stack. And then you have got the, um, the Android and iOS SDKs so that you can build your application, mobile application to connect these devices um, back to the cloud using MQTT. Now, FreeRTOS has um, taken a step further and provided custom GAT profiles for MQTT over BLE. So um, on top of BLE profile, we have the MQTT so that the devices, the BLE devices can communicate directly to a, with AWS IoT and use its different features using the mobile device as a proxy. And Wi-Fi provisioning over BLE is another custom profile that we built to securely send Wi-Fi credentials to your device over BLE. And this is really useful for, for um, use cases where we need to uh, provision Wi-Fi credentials onto new appliances installed at home, for example. And now let's talk about the first custom profile, Wi-Fi provisioning over BLE. Um, um, MQTT over BLE. So MQTT over BLE actually enables um, your, uh, anyone using BLE devices to connect to AWS IoT via a mobile phone as a proxy, as you can see on the diagram on the right. The iOS and the Android SDKs um, provide the proxy libraries, and you can use simple demo applications that are provided within the SDKs itself um, and, and free out our source code to quickly, uh, to quickly get started on this. There is, a, there is a sample application that you can um, that you can use as a reference, but it's mainly for you to develop your own application, that uh, custom built application using the SDK libraries. The mobile device has to securely connect to AWS IoT, and there has to be a, a process where it authenticates and authorizes with AWS IoT. And for that, um, an example that we provided is with the Amazon Cognito service. Uh, Amazon Cognito service is, is for user signups, sign in, and access control to web and mobile applications. So this is something that we have um, uh, that we have provided as an example code you can use as a reference to get you started connecting your BLE device to, to IoT core. Now, what is the advantage of MQTT over BLE? Um, seems like a new concept, but MQTT over BLE, if you imagine that, is, is basically a conduit, becomes a conduit from the BLE, the end devices, directly to AWS IoT. And you can use AWS services such as over-the-air updates and AWS IoT device shadow. Over-the-air updates, you can use the same mechanism that we have built for over-the-air updates and push it down directly to your end devices, the BLE devices, to up, up, update your firmware. So you can use the OTA service which, is, which becomes completely agnostic of the transport layer protocol, whether you, what it uses underneath. Whether it's TCPIP based or BLE based, it doesn't really matter. And similarly for AWS IoT device shadow, you can use different services uh, when we are talking MQTT uh, on top of BLE. 
the second custom profile that we have generated that we have created for um, for uh, connecting your BLE devices, microcontroller based BLE devices to the cloud is uh, Wi-Fi provisioning over BLE. And this becomes really important when you have to, let's say, provision um, SSID or password over the BLE channel. Uh, you have seen the provisioning steps like uh, for, for uh, new, new appliances uh, being, uh, being provisioned. Field technicians come in and quickly set up and install IoT devices, um, these devices, by using the BLE configuration, uh, configuration path. So this, this saves a lot of effort and, um, and uh, other problems that, that is encountered with other provisioning mechanisms like soft AP-based Wi-Fi um, provisioning. Users can save multiple Wi-Fi configurations. And this becomes really important if you have multiple devices and Wi-Fi routers at home, and you need to save multiple Wi-Fi configurations in each of these machines. And we have also provided examples in which you can uh, reprioritize, add, and delete saved networks from all the list of Wi-Fi configurations that you have saved on your device. For security, uh, we um, security is one of the topmost concerns when we are pairing the BLE device with the mobile phone, and that's why we use the the standard, the BLE Secure Connection standard that is provided by um, uh, Bluetooth Low Energy Standard Protocol uh, for um, for uh, the, the initial pairing. Um, and if you want to get started with the custom profile of using Wi-Fi provisioning over BLE, you can, you can use the demo code included in the source code uh, that will help you quickly get started. Moving over to, the, uh, to one of the most important aspects is, is over the air updates. And this has come after repeated customer um, customer inputs and customer feedback that we need updatability. All IoT devices need updatability. But the problem that exists today is fragmentation of the market. Um, all customers use different types of OTA feature and capability, and they do it themselves. What this means is that there is not a single solution, not a standardized solution, and, and these solutions are not scalable when they're trying to change applications, change microcontrollers, change the end devices. Um, and updating a few devices manually is viable. Um, when we think about OTA, we think about updating firmware manually, um, pushing the USB plugin or a serial interface and then push the new firmware. But when we're talking about IoT devices, we're talking about millions of devices potentially. And to update that manually is, is not viable, it's not practical. And therefore, over-the-air update solution becomes more practical at that point, at that scale, and more cost-effective. But for microcontroller-based application, needs um, careful consideration. Where we are thinking about saving every kilobyte of memory without compromising security of the microcontroller-based uh, devices, you need to think about both the devices aspect of over-the-air updates and the cloud aspect. We have to um, optimize for both of these. Let's look at how, how this is done and what is the approach that we have taken within AWS. So FreeRTOS um, provides an OTA service where you can use the AWS IoT device management. Um, if you haven't seen device management, you can actually um, look it up. So you can go to the console and um, schedule an OTA update job. You can do it for um, remotely updating device, devices or a group of devices. You can think of all the sensors in a building uh, building floor, for example. And you get the ability uh, to code sign the firmware images while scheduling the update. And the devices have the capability to validate the signatures when the firmware is downloaded to the device. So you get an end-to-end -end security and auth authentication whenever you are sending the firmware updates to the, to, uh, the devices. And this helps, uh, this actually helps customers be assured that the firmware is coming from the right source, a trusted source, and hasn't been trans, uh, tampered during, uh, during transit. Updates are streamed to the devices over MQTT using the same TLS connection that was established um, in the first place for devices to connect to AWS IoT, which means that whenever, whenever, whenever you, you, we are using the same socket, we are using the same TLS connection, it saves precious memory on the microcontroller-based devices because you don't have to open a second socket. Um, just, just for, um, for OTA. Um, and after the new image is downloaded, we have APIs um, to, to actually see 
to uh, to to measure if the installation has been correctly done and the reboot um, uh, and the reboot logic is present. Um, now let's quickly go into some of the technical details of how OT on FreeRTOS is done. Um, for any OT service, an OT over MQTT especially has two distinct owners. For the first is the operator, the user who schedules the OT update job. And the second is the device, the end device on the field, which takes control after the update job has been scheduled. And the device makes sure that the entire update process is smooth. And within the device, I'm talking about um, two, two different aspects, bootloader, which is basically using used for booting the new firmware, the new updated firmware, and OT agent, which manages the, um, the entire process of, of firmware coming in into the device itself. Now, the flow is, um, is multi-step. At first, the operator authors the firmware update. So you're building a new firmware, you're building a new version. You build a new firmware and, um, and upload it to the cloud, upload it to Amazon S3 or any web hosted service. Now, uh, the, the operator schedules an update job using the device management console, as I mentioned um, earlier where he or she can sign the firmware and select the right um, S3 bucket um, being done uh, used for the OTA process. But the console is just one of the, um, one of the solutions. Um, for advanced users, OTA can also be scheduled using command line interface or CLI. But once the OTA update job, whichever method, whether it's a CLI or the console, but once the OTA update job has been scheduled, the devices are notified um, that an update is coming. So there's a new firmware. All the devices that are subscribed to the MQ topic know that uh, there's this new firmware that is uh, that is ready for um, ready for them. Um, now at this point, the device takes over. The device, especially the OTA agent within the device, takes control. The device downloads the new image um, in chunks from AWS IoT Core and writes those chunks to flash, flash within the memory itself, where within the microcontroller itself in a separate partition. So um, if you think of a one MB uh, image, you split it into ch chunks, maybe, uh, maybe five KB chunks, and those are downloaded back to the flash and kept in a separate partition. The primary image, the, the, the former that is currently running is the one that is currently executing. And it basically sends um, the chunks over to a second partition within the, within the flash. The OT agent now stitches the chunks together and in sequence and verifies um, that, that the signature is, is done. If successful, um, it notifies the application that the new image is ready to be used. At this point, the bootloader, um, the bootloader within the device takes control. It verifies that the new image comes from the trusted source and initiates a self-test. It checks for, um, uh, for the checksum um, and the image, if it's coming from the right source and verifies the signature that was used in code signing. And if all checks pass, the older image is deleted and the device boots from the new image. So um, you might think that, why, why is that necessary? But that's a, that is necessary because the old image is deleted as a security practice um, to prevent the device to roll back to an unsecured image, um, and therefore the security patch is coming in. Finally, uh, after everything has been done, this device sends the status to AWS IoT or any cloud that the OT update job has been successfully completed. So this is an end-to-end cloud-to-device um, uh, device story where you initiate the process, the operator initiates a process on the cloud by updating um, a job um, the notification is sent to the device, the device takes over, uh, downloads the entire firmware, and it notifies it back to the cloud that the, the execution has been completed and a new firmware has been successfully installed. So um, this is the entire OT action that we, where we have done for, um, for MQTT, but um, uh, you're, you're free to use it for um, HTTP-based downloads too. So, uh, for example, if you use MQTT for just for notification and you want to download megabytes of firmware over HTTP, you have the flexibility to do that too. Now, um, 
how do we get started? How do we start building new IoT projects? Um, freeartos.org is the place where you will find all information. You can download source code, you can review documentation, um, the API documentation, and the demos for all FreeRTOS libraries, whether it's the FreeRTOS kernel or, or any of the IoT libraries that are, that are provided with it. And um, if you already have selected a microcontroller, um, let's say from SD Microelectronics, from TI, from NXP, Espressif, any, if you have chosen any microcontroller um, that you want to um, use, you can go to the IoT reference integrations page and you can download the ported and pre-integrated and tested and validated code and projects from over 40 microcontroller based dev kits. So you will get a head start in, in starting your IoT projects. At any state, stage of your project, whether it's you're building your evaluation board or you're deploying it or using OTA feature, if you face any technical issues and you need support for anything, you can interact with us directly um, by, by using the free Atos community, community forums. Um, it's, uh, it's basically the link is um, here. You can see it um, on the screen, forums.freeartos.org. And we'll be happy to interact and help you out on, on any problems that you see. Uh, for documentation, you'll find most of the um, API documentation applications and demos on freeartos.org. But if you need other documentation types which are specific for specific to AWS, or think um, you would need a porting guide, for example, uh, how to port the IoT libraries, you can go to the docs.aws.amazon.com page and um, you'll find relevant documentation over there too. At this point, um, I'll stop and see if you have any questions uh, that I can, I, I can answer there in the forum. That's it, so thank you so much. And this is a great chance to ask any questions you might have. Right now, the QA is completely open. Um, so anything you might be curious about, please jump in the chat or the QA section. Uh, and otherwise, I'm just going to start asking a few questions because we've got a few minutes left. So Tanway, while we're waiting for, oh, here we have one question from Andre. Um, is the ESP32 fully supported for free RTOS? Um, so yeah, um, there is a reference port for ESP32. So if you want to use ESP32, you can actually come uh, go to a reference integrations page. You can download the, uh, not download the code and you can build your applications on it. You can use OTA, you can use BLE, uh, the abstraction layer and Wi-Fi abstraction layer. So, so yes, uh, we have provided reference integration. But if you need um, any specific information of, of about the BSPs and the drivers um, pertinent to the ESP32 chipset itself, we are actually um, uh, closely partnering with ESP, so we can help you out, or specific can directly help you out. Excellent. The same one. And then there was another request to repost the white paper in the chat. Esley, I'll go ahead and do that here in a moment. Um, and then, ooh, one feature about Zoom that I'll, I was actually just recently made aware of is there's three little dots down in the bottom of the chat area, and you can click that to save the entire chat conversation, which I found to be extremely helpful as I don't have to copy and paste furiously before the session ends. Um, but I'll go ahead and repost that here, Esley, in one moment. There was another question, Tanmoy. How does AWS recommend recovering from a failed OTA update? Yeah, um, so there are, there are two aspects to it. When you see a failed OTA update, it basically takes into consideration that uh, when did the failure happen and what was the reason behind that? For example, uh, if there was a network issue or the, the, um, the OT update during the entire process was, was interrupted, it goes back um, to where it started from by default, for example. We have also added a feature that will help you get started from where you left. So um, uh, for example, if you, have, you, you were 50% through and you want to start all over again, you can do it from there. There's a new feature that we have just added. But that is that is one of the um, one of the things. But if you don't find um, the um, uh, the failed OT update, you can find don't find any of these reasons because of that happening. You need to go into. I mean, that's a tricky process. You need to go into the device logs to see what was the reason for the failed um, OT update. Um, the normal um, the the 
the logs that we see, see on the cloud is basically whether the uh, it has been successfully completed or whether it's executing or it's failed. But when you see failed, you need to dig in further to see, uh, look at the device logs to see what actually happened. Whether was this something else, or uh, you need to dig deeper. So yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Kenway. All right, everybody. We've got about four more minutes before this session ends. Uh, if there's any more questions, please don't hesitate to push that into the QA or the chat. Um, and then coming up next at three thirty, we'll have uh, Nathan Collins, and you can stay in here, and then. We'll transfer that over. But up until then, another great opportunity to pick uh, pick Tamway's brain. I've got, I've got a question for you, Tamway. What are you uh, What are you reading these days? Oh, I'm reading a lot of things, um, uh, especially for the reInvent conference that's coming up. Um, so, reInvent is basically AWS's annual conference that's going to start next month, uh, eleven thirty, and. Mm -hmm. uh, the you should post a link in the open. chat here so we can all uh, all participate. <laughs> uh, but it looks like we got one other question, uh, two questions come in. So we got three minutes. Let's see if we can get through them here. Bill Farrow asks: Do most firmware projects use two X images, one that you are running and the one that you are upgrading to? That is that is that is exactly right. Um, so we split it into two, two partitions. One is the format that is currently um, being used and one is um, that is being currently chunked and put together into a second partition. So we recommend whenever you're choosing um, a microcontroller for OT-based applications, you use twice the, uh, twice, twice the memory allocation um, because you need to store two images. Excellent. And then one more, we got two minutes left here. Uh, which is the smallest development board we can use to text AWS IoT? Uh, smallest, I mean, uh, you have you have several options. Um, one of the things um, one of the things that you can do is uh, we have seen several um, several people using ESP32 as a starting point. Uh, because it provides you a stamp board, and we have seen NXP boards being used for several purposes. Uh, but it's it's been we have seen a lot of customers using uh, very different, very many boards for starting with it. Excellent. So go check out the documentation there on that page. All right, two minutes. Let's see if we've got the the two few questions jumped in here. Uh, question: How do you upgrade the bootloader? So. Um, yeah, this this is a process. The bootloader is is from a microcontroller vendor, and we do not upgrade the bootloader right now unless um, we need to specifically um, go into the form, uh, go into the device and upgrade the BSPs. So we use a bootloader from microcontroller vendors. We uh, uh, using the OT update. It's uh, it's, it's not done. 